Hello, Auggies Worldwide. I'm Dave Kastler, amateur radio call sign KE0OG, here with another Ask Dave video. Today we're answering a question from David Spivey, KR4WX. And of course, in answering it, I'm going to go way beyond what he asked. And we're going to take a look at transmission lines that consist of two wires next to each other. So this is the complement to the video we did about coaxial cable. This one is about things like ladder line and stuff like that. I've made a few charts. Let's dive in. The question from David Spivey is, um, I am David KR4WX. How do you tell what ohms a particular ladder line is? Can you tell if it is 300 ohms, 450 ohms, or what? If you can, please tell me. Thanks, in 73. Well, as a matter of fact, I can tell you, but let's start with a little bit of a discussion from the ARRL antenna book. Now, I'm an edition behind on this. I'm on the 23rd edition, but uh, I don't think it has changed terribly since uh, then. Uh, and we'll go into section 23, which talks about uh, the various kinds of transmission lines and some of the uh, mechanics and also the uh, mathematics that has to do with it. First of all, let's look at three common types of uh, parallel wire transmission lines. Uh, the one at the top is 300 ohm twin lead, which is or was real common back when black and white TVs uh, came out, before there was cable television. Um, it is still available, although uh, it's a little bit pricey. Uh, it's not like the real cheap stuff that you used to be able to get. Uh, the next is the 75 ohm twin lead, which you'll notice is uh, narrower than the other. As you move the cables closer together, the uh, impedance goes down. Now underneath that in C is 450 ohm so-called window line because of these uh, things in here which look sort of like windows. Um, and this is 450 ohms. This is very common. You see this a lot. And when people talk about ladder line, they often actually mean this, although ladder line is something different. Let's take a look at real uh, window line right here. Okay, it's on the order of an inch across. And these are like, I think, number 16 uh, connectors here. This one happens to be composed of um, stranded wire. Oh, I much prefer working with stranded wire over solid wire. But a lot of the window line, if it's not otherwise specified, it's going to be solid con uh, uh, conductors. That's usually not too bad, though. Now, here's real ladder line. This is real ladder line. This is, uh, um, you can see the dipole right there, or I should say the doublet. Um, piece of wire cut in the middle and fed with this ladder line. Now, this ladder line has got spacers, but otherwise the insulator is air. And this is usually, but not always, made up to be 600 ohms. You can find this uh, on the internet. It's a little harder to find than window line, but you can find it. And note here, I want you to note that it's being held out away from the house by something that looks like it's grabbing one of those insulators right there and holding it out from the house. There's a reason for that. We'll come back to that later. Now let's talk about these two wire transmission lines. This is true open wire or true ladder line where there are insulating spacers every so often. Usually it's number 12 or number 14 wire. The spacers can be two inches to six inches apart. I have seen this homebrewed and you can homebrew it. The thing that you need to be careful of is that the spacing is kept constant, okay? There are two ways you can fasten these spacers. One is to like feed the wire through them, which is a royal pain. Um, 
like through a hole and put a, a drop of epoxy or solder or something there. Uh, you can do this with insulated wire or with uh, uh, op open wire, uninsulated wire. Another way that you can do it is to bring the wire up near the spacer, then take a little piece of wire, wrap it around and around the spacer like that. That actually holds it in place pretty well, okay? What do you use for spacers? Well, spacers may be made from materials such as Teflon, plexiglass, phenolic, polystyrene. Now notice this, plastic clothespins, not uh, wood. Or plastic hair curlers. Um, show this to your wife and see how willing she is to give you her hair curlers. Uh, materials commonly used in high quality spacers are isolantite or steatite, lucite, and polystyrene. Teflon is generally not used because of its higher cost. Teflon in big chunks is pretty expensive. Now the spacer length varies from two to six inches. Okay, and you see the spacer length here. I'm going to guess that's two to three, maybe three inches apart. Hard to say. Um, and let's take a look at this now. Okay, two conductors. And by the way, these can be hollow. You can do this with like copper tubing or something like that if you want to. And very, very, very high power transmitters like shortwave stations will use open wire line made of tubing because the electrons, the electron flow is in the outer skin of the wire. Okay, now that's very important to remember because in terms of conductivity, uh, normally you take the cross section here and that determines the conductivity. But when you're dealing with RF, it's the skin effect. It's the area, not the volume, uh, or, or, uh, that uh, is important here. Now we'll come back to this formula in a minute. This is an approximation. Let's go take it something. Uh, take a look at something that's a, a little bit more definitive than this. But note the D is the outer diameter of one of the conductors, and S is center to center spacing. Okay, so. Yeah, yeah, the characteristic impedance of air insulated parallel conductor line neglecting the effect of the spacers is given by the characteristic impedance is 120 times the inverse hyperbolic cosine of the ratio of S to D. That is the ratio of the separation, that's what the S is for, to D, which is the diameter. If you separate it more, you get a higher um, intrinsic or characteristic impedance. Now this can be uh, simplified to 276 times the log base 10 of the ratio of the separation to the diameter plus this other little coefficient in here. You take uh, D where is D? That is, uh, uh, I think that should be an S, not a D. It's an S right there. That's a mistake in the book. Over the uh, center to center distance here, square it and subtract 1. So this is not quite 2 times S over D. Not quite. Um, but an approximation of this is 276 times the log of two times the separation over the diameter of the wire. So definitely that D right there, oops, taking things apart here, um, that's an S. I should let uh, the ARRL know about that. Uh, I doubt very few hams look at this. Now, if, if you go back to this right here, we've got this approximation here. Log is log base 10. If it's natural logarithm, it's spelled L-N rather than log. Whenever you see log, it's base 10. Okay, so we get the uh, characteristic impedance of the line from that. 
we can take a graph. Now I've modified this graph just a little bit. This is right straight out of the antenna book. This is the spacing in inches, center to center, okay? Notice that it's a logarithmic scale. This is a linear scale, the characteristic impedance, okay? These are for tubing diameters and then the distances apart. I picked number 14 wire here because this is really common house wire and you can get this stuff very readily down at Home Depot. Number 14 wire, um, a 500 foot spool is less than $100. So you could make 250 feet of this for that plus whatever you use for spacers if you're successful at getting your significant others uh, curling uh, curlers away from her or him these days um, you can make this or you can just get little bits of plastic or uh, whatever you think you might want to use it doesn't take much this will give you if you use five inch spacing it will give you 600 ohms note that as the wire gets thinner the ratio of the separation to the diameter goes up and so you get higher characteristic impedance now, in another video, I'm going to go into why the higher characteristic impedance is so important. But 600 ohms is used a lot. Now, I showed you this stuff that's 450 ohms right here. It's about an inch apart and about number 16 wire here. So if we were to look at that on the chart here, number 16 wire about an inch apart here would be about 450 ohms okay so this is about 450 ohms right here now remember what the characteristic impedance means it is the ratio of the voltage per meter divided by the current per meter so if there's more voltage and less current you've got a higher impedance by the way it is current that interacts with the ohmic resistance of the line to create losses. So if you can lower the current by upping the voltage, you're going to get less loss. And that's how we get less loss out of these things right here. Okay. Now I want to tell you one other thing about um, these lines. Remember I pointed out that this guy had this thing held out away from his house. Here's why. There was a gentleman by the name of John Henry Pointing, and yes, that's just Pointing, uh, who lived from 1852 to 1914, and I had to study his equations when I was uh, working on my electrical engineering degree, and we were studying fields and waves. If this is coax right here, this is the outer conductor, this is the inner conductor, of course, the electrons are confined to the conductors but the pointing vector actually is in the dielectric and the pointing vector which is pointing at you out of the screen the pointing vector is the actual energy vector let me see if i can get that back up there okay it's the actual energy vector if you look at the energy in watt hours or the power in watts it actually, mathematically, travels, you ready for this, in the dielectric. Okay, it's in the dielectric. So if you look at coax like this, it turns out that all of the energy is contained inside the coax. It's one of the nice things about coax. Now, you have to consider that the shielding may not be perfect and if the shielding is not perfect you're going to have some losses here um, but you get something like LMR 400 it's really hard to beat it's almost absolutely 100 percent sealed and so all the energy is in here it means none is out here so you can coil this stuff up you can do whatever you want with it and you're not going to affect 
the energy inside here. This is coax as we normally see it. However, if you're doing this, where is the pointing vector? The pointing vector comes in between the conductors. The actual energy is carried in between the two lines. Now, is it just there on one line of force? No, not at all. It's around the conductors, okay? Around the conductors, there's some out here, there's some out here that drops off very rapidly as you get away from it. Most of the energy is in kind of a, a little field like that. Now, that explains why this guy is keeping his feed line away from the house. Because the energy doesn't just travel down the middle, and it certainly doesn't travel in the copper. It's just electrons traveling in the copper. But the energy field, the electromagnetic field, uh, is around this. So he's keeping it separated from the house. You need to do the same when you are using like ladder line, something like that. If you have excess ladder line, you don't just coil it up like you can with coax. You have to kind of spread it out on the ground and you, you're, you should know that it's going to react with the ground too, okay? So that is one of the disadvantages of these uh, twin wire or ladder line or window line uh, is that you need to keep them kind of away from everything. Uh, it doesn't mean that the world's going to end if it happens to be up against your gutter, uh, but it uh, does uh, compromise the thing, and the best, best practice is to keep it separate like this. Now let's talk a little bit about impedances. Uh, coax, of course, <clears throat> is the coaxial line, here's the uh, rough approximation for the uh, impedance of coaxial line, is uh, the inner diameter of the outer conductor divided by the outer diameter of the inner conductor log base 10 times 138. And usually we use in ham radio a uh, 50 ohm, 50 ohmish cable for that, okay. Now, if you are going to put a ballon, since this is unbalanced, whereas this is balanced line, this is balanced here, um, all of these are balanced, you need to keep into in mind the actual ratio of the inductance. This is 450 ohms. You need a 9 to 1 ballon. Okay, a 9 to 1 ballon to properly match this to coaxial cable. If you're going to use something like this, which I'm going to assume is 600 ohms, you need a 12 to 1 ballon, okay, a 12 to 1 ballon uh, to make this work. So um, keep that in mind that it's not your just standard old 4 to 1 ballon. Uh, a lot of people make and a lot of people use 4 to 1 balance. They're good for things like folded dipoles and so on. But uh, um, to actually, if you're going to go from coax to ladder line, uh, you should be using an appropriate ballon. Otherwise, you're going to get some reflections and some uh, difficulties with SWR. Plus, you can also get heating in the, in the ballon. Okay. I always remember this guy from my Fields and Waves course, which I took in Florida uh, at the University of South Florida in Tampa, Florida, um, back when I was in the Air Force, also when they were building the Buccaneers Stadium uh, of recent fame. But uh, this guy here answered a lot of questions for me about where the energy actually is inside of uh, a, a cable. Okay, so I hope that gives you a nice little overview, uh, David, for what you're looking for. The 450 ohm window line, when you see this, you're usually looking at 450 ohms. These are not so common, 
Okay, the 300 ohm is a lot more common than the 75 ohm. Okay, and you can get fancy stuff here with hollow centers and everything like that. Uh, note one thing that because this is exposed to the air, rain will have an effect on this because rain has a different dielectric constant and can cause the SWR to change. Um, if you have a uh, twin lead like this or something and you get a lot of mud on it or something like that, that can also cause an impedance bump and cause the SWR to change. Whereas coaxial cable, um, all the energy is confined inside, so if there's mud outside, it doesn't matter. You can even bury this. Uh, you can put it in construction. You can put it up near other electric lines and so on. It doesn't affect, affect it if it's good quality coax. So there you go, David. I hope that answers your question. All right, there we have a, a little simple explanation of uh, things like ladder line, uh, window line, twin lead, and so on, the kinds of things that affect it, uh, how you can actually make your own. Uh, and some hams do that because if they've got a long length of this or they want to put some significant power into it, they might want to make their own ladder line. And it's something that you can do relatively cheaply if you are patient. You can also order open wire ladder line, the 600 ohm variety. There are a few places that sell it on the internet. I think Wireman has it. And uh, you can get the window line easily. That's readily available everywhere. And of course, coax cable, wherever you want it. So there we are. We've learned a little bit more about transmission lines this evening. And uh, if you'd like to help support this channel financially, please take a look at dcastler.com support. And until we next meet, 73.